Good morning. It's beginning to look a lot like Christmas, isn't it? Uh, thank you to uh, um, Miss Coleman, Lillian Coleman, and for and the helpers. Yes, I know Angela and, and others were in here helping out uh, make this uh, uh, platform look much more in the holiday spirit. Today we are coming to the third and final part of our series on little letters. Part of our year-long focus on the Bible, we spent the last couple weeks looking at the short letters in the New Testament. Um, the previous two letters were only one chapter long, so not too, too long at all. Um, I know I got into a little trouble last week when I asked, because no one remembered. But let's see if we can remember what we looked at. Do you remember what we looked at last week? What little letter we looked at last week? Jude, Jude yes. And two weeks before? Philemon, yes, look, I'm so glad. Uh, yes, uh, so proud of your memories. Yes, uh, and not feeling like a total failure for, like, for not preaching, right? All right, we're listening, okay. Today we're going to look at Titus. Titus is the longest of those three letters, though. It's, it's a whopping three chapters. So it's triple the length. Well, not really, because they're really short chapters. Um, but Titus is a, is a very important letter as well. We won't actually even have time to cover all three chapters, so we'll give you the time between now and the Christmas party tonight to look at the first two chapters on your own. We'll look at chapter three uh, later on. But Titus is a very important chapter, a very important book, because it deals with something, several things, I think, that apply to us as Christians in 2019. The internet has several unwritten rules. Do you know what some of them might be? Well, one of the biggest ones is do not go into the comment section. Avoid the comments at all costs. You might see an article that is interesting that is entertaining, that is thought-provoking, and you're like, oh, I wonder what other people are having to say about this. And so you go into the comments section, and it's a dumpster fire. It's got trolls there talking about the weirdest stuff just to get a rise out of people. It has people on both extremes typing in all caps, yelling at each other, calling each other the worst names imaginable. It's, it's a horror show going into the comment section because the comment section is filled with cretins. Have you heard that word cretins before? It's an older term. I, I think several of us have heard it before. It's kind of not used too much these days. But Cretan is, is not a good thing. Right? You do not want to be called a Cretan. Cretan is, is kind of, like I said, an old pejorative term for someone that is stubborn, is dumb, is brutish, violent, uh, likes to quarrel. This is not someone that you would, should want to be. Cretans. They're the ones that live in the comment section. And in fact, Cretans were a real group of people. They were the people back in these Bible times that lived on the isle, the island of Crete, there in the Mediterranean. And their reputation was so bad that it's still alive a few thousand years later. This whole island was filled with stubborn, mean, quarrelsome, ignorant, stupid, fighting, violent people. And these Cretans were the people that Titus was ministering to. Titus was there in the island of Crete trying to spread the good news of the gospel to these Cretans. And Paul writes Titus this letter to encourage him, to give him some instruction and some encouragement as he works with these horrible people. To give us a better, more in-depth overview of the entire book of Titus, let's take one more look from, at a video from our friends from the Bible Project. 
Paul's letter to Titus. Titus was a Greek follower of Jesus who was for years a trusted co-worker and traveling companion of Paul's. He had helped Paul in a number of crisis situations in the past, and in this letter we discover that Paul had assigned him the task of going to Crete, a large island off the coast of Greece, to restore order to a network of house churches. Now, Cretan culture was notorious in the ancient world. One of the Greek words for being a liar was kretidzo, to be a Cretan. These people were infamous for treachery and greed. Most of the men on the island had served as mercenary soldiers to the highest bidder, and the island cities were known as being unsafe, plagued by violence and sexual corruption. However, the island of Crete had many strategic harbors, and they serviced cities all over the ancient Mediterranean Sea. And so, from Paul's point of view, Crete was the perfect place to start a network of churches. Now, we don't know the details, but somehow these churches came under the influence of corrupt Cretan leaders. They said they were Christians, but they were ruining the churches. And so Paul assigned Titus with the task of going there to set things straight, and this letter provided the instructions. It has a pretty straightforward design. After a brief introduction, Paul gives Titus clear instructions about his tasks in the church. He then offers guidance about the new kind of household and then about the new kind of humanity that the gospel could create in these Cretan communities. Paul then closes the letter with some final greetings. So Paul opens the whole thing by reminding Titus that his message as an apostle is about the hope of eternal life, that is, the life of the new creation, that is available starting now through Jesus the Messiah. And this hope was promised long ago by the God who does not lie. Now, this little opening comment introduces an important theme underlying the whole letter. One of the problems in the Cretan churches was that they had assimilated their ideas about Jesus, the Christian God, to their ideas about the Greek gods that they grew up with, specifically Zeus, their chief god. Cretan people claimed that Zeus was actually born on their island, and they loved to tell stories and mythologies about Zeus's underhanded character. He would seduce women and lie to get his way. And Paul wants to be really clear. The God revealed through Jesus is totally different than Zeus. His basic character traits are faithfulness and truth, which means the Christian way of life will be about truth also, which will be a real change for these Cretans. So Paul then addresses Titus with a twofold task. He says the first one is to appoint new leaders for each church community, a team of what he calls elders mature husbands or fathers whose way of life is totally different from Cretan culture. They are to be known for integrity, total devotion to Jesus, for self-control and generosity, both in their families and in the community at large. And these new leaders are to teach the good news about Jesus and replace the corrupt leaders who need to be confronted. That's Titus's second task. Paul identifies the teachers as those of the circumcision. In other words, they were ethnically Jewish Cretans who said that they followed Jesus, but similar to the problems in Galatia, these people demanded that non-Jewish Christians be circumcised and follow the laws of the Torah if they really wanted to become followers of the Jewish Messiah. Paul says that they're obsessed with Jewish myths and human commands. And to top it off, they're just in the church leadership business to make money. And so Paul, in a brilliant move, he pulls a quote from an ancient Cretan poet, Epimenides, who was very frank and honest about the character of his own people. He said Cretans are always liars, vicious beasts, and lazy gluttons. They blur the lines between true and false, between good and evil, and they're just in it for the money. And so while these leaders claim to know God, their Cretan way of life denies him. They have to be dealt with. And this leads Paul into the next section. Because of these corrupt leaders, many Christians in these churches now have homes and personal lives that are a total wreck. And three different times, Paul highlights the result of all this. The message about Jesus is discredited. Their non-Christian neighbors now have good cause to make evil accusations. And all of this makes the teaching about God our Savior totally unattractive and not compelling to anybody. So Paul paints a picture of the ideal Cretan household that is devoted to Jesus. It would be elderly men and women who are full of integrity and self-control, so they can become models of character to the young people. And the young women shouldn't be sleeping around and avoiding marriage, as was fashionable on Crete at the time, but rather they should be looking for faithful partners so they can raise stable, healthy families. And the young men are to do the same. They're to be known as productive, healthy citizens. 
Christian slaves on Crete were in a unique position because we know that because of the gospel, they were treated as equals in Paul's church communities. However, there was a danger that they would use that equality as license to disrespect their masters and then become associated with slave rebellions, which would further discredit the Christian message. You can see Paul negotiating a fine line here. He believes that the gospel about Jesus needs to prove its redemptive power in the public square if it's really going to transform Cretan culture. And that's not going to happen through social upheaval or by Christians cloistering away from urban life. The Christian message will be compelling to Cretans when Christians fully participate in public life, when their lives and homes look similar on the surface. Because after a closer look, their neighbors will discover that Christians live by a totally different value system system out of devotion to a totally different God. And that's the difference that Paul beautifully summarizes at the end of chapter 2. He says the value system driving the Christian way of life is God's generous grace, which appeared in the person of Jesus and will appear again at his return. This grace was demonstrated when Jesus gave up his honor to die a shameful death on behalf of his enemies so that he could rescue and redeem them. And it's that same grace that calls God's people to say no to corrupt ways of life that are inconsistent with the generous love of God. Paul then zooms out from the Christian household to a vision of Christians living like new humans in Cretan society. Of all people, Christians should be known as the ideal citizens, peaceable, generous, obedient to authorities, known for pursuing the common good. But this is really different from how Cretans grew up. How are Christians supposed to sustain this countercultural way of life? And Paul believes the power source is the transforming love of the three-in-one God announced in the gospel. And he explores this with a really beautiful poem. He says, God's kindness and love are what saved us, despite ourselves, so that through the Holy Spirit, God washed and rebirthed and renewed people and through Jesus has provided a way for people to be declared right before him. And all of this opens up eternal life, that is, a new future in the new creation. This living story is so powerful, it can produce new kinds of people. Paul's convinced that spirit-empowered faithfulness to the teachings of Jesus will declare God's grace all over the island of Crete and all over the world. Paul concludes by promising to send backup for Titus, either Artemis or Tychicus, and then he says hello to their common friends. And so the letter ends. The letter of Titus shows us Paul's missionary strategy for churches to become agents of transformation within their communities. It won't happen by waging a culture war or by assimilating to the Cretan way of life. Rather, he calls these Christians to wisely participate in Cretan culture. They need to reject what's corrupt but also embrace what's good there. If they can learn to live peaceably and devote themselves to Jesus and to the common good, Christians will, in his words, show the beauty of the message about our saving God. And that's what the letter to Titus is all about. It's a good overview, huh? A lot of, a lot of good information is packed into these short little letters. And you can see that one of the major themes of the book of Titus and the, the central truth that we are looking at this morning is that to be a follower of God is to be a helper of people. This is one of Paul's clearest messages here in his writing to Titus is that if you want to be a follower of God, you need to be a helper of people. So let's pick up our study in chapter 3, starting with verse 1, which says, Remind the believers to yield to the authority of rulers and government leaders, to obey them, to be ready to do good, to speak no evil about anyone, to live in peace, and to be gentle and polite to all people. He's saying, remind them to do this. Now, why would Paul be saying to Titus to remind them? Because this is not how things were going at the time, right? You don't say, oh, remind, remind someone to, to drink water as they have a glass of water to their lips, right? They are surrounded here these, these, 
by the Cretan culture. This Cretan culture is a culture that doesn't respect their leaders, doesn't obey their governmental leaders. They're, they do not do good. They, they speak evil about everyone. They, they don't live in peace. There's always conflict happening. They are not gentle. They are not polite. This is the, the culture that is surrounding them. And Paul's telling Titus, you cannot be like that. Christians, the, the, the church there, cannot live lives that have these qualities, these characteristics. You are to be different. But does this sound familiar to us, living in our society in 2019? Do you look around and see that our culture is one that doesn't really respect authority much anymore that does not really do too much good for others that is really ready to speak evil about others to that that we look like to live in conflict that that we've lost our ability to to be polite and have compassionate conversations it seems more and more that our society is becoming like those two old cantankerous men from the Muppets. These guys that are always ready to critique and criticize and tear down. We see this in our society, do we not? We see it in the, the political arena very clearly. Where Truth doesn't seem to matter much anymore. What seems to matter is winning. Where the two parties have seemed to cease caring about governing the average American citizen in a good way and have simply resigned themselves to beating the other party to staying in power. And if you think it's bad, it's been bad before, wait till this impeachment thing gets geared up and more and more. We just hear this criticisms back and forth, complaints back and forth, conflict back and forth. The Republicans accusing the Democrats of, of being crazy witch hunters. And the, the Democrats, you know, accusing the Republicans of being corrupt Russian agents. Nothing but conflict and criticism. We see this played out in society with the increase of hate crimes and mass shootings. Oh, you don't look like me? Well, let me tell you something. Oh, you didn't treat me like I wanted to be treated, so I'm going to shoot you and 20 of my other classmates. Constant conflict, critiquing tearing each other down. We see this in the more mundane things like social media and, and, and sports fandom. People always just constantly bickering and fighting, complaining, calling each other names, tearing each other down. This is increasingly what our society is becoming and has already become. And Paul continues, though. He says, In the past, we also were foolish. We did not obey. We were wrong. And we were slaves to many things our bodies wanted and enjoyed. We spent our lives doing evil and being jealous. People hated us, and we hated each other. Paul's saying, yes, you look around and, and, and society and culture is, is warped, it's twisted, it's not anything that you should emulate, but we were like that. When we look at society, we can see our reflection, or at least how our reflection used to be. Because we used to do those same things. We used to be just as foolish as they were. We used to be just as filled with hate as they were. And so we can identify because we've been there ourselves. But, Paul says, but 
something has changed. But, he says in verse 4, when the kindness and the love of God our Savior was shown, he saved us because of his mercy. It was not because of good deeds we did to be right with him. We didn't earn his mercy. We didn't earn a good standing with God. He saved us through the washing that makes us new people through the Holy Spirit. God poured out richly upon us that Holy Spirit through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Being made right with God by his grace, we could have the hope of receiving the life that never ends. Paul says that, yes, we can see our past reflection in the culture and the society around us, but things have been made different in your life and in my life because of the grace of God. There was nothing that you did or I did to make ourselves better. It was simply God's grace that came in and transformed us. And now, because of that transforming power of grace, we are in a different spot We do not reflect that foolishness, that violence, that stupidity, that anger, that conflict that the rest of the Cretans do. We have been changed. Have you noticed that whenever someone undergoes some substantial life change, they usually respond to the people that that used to be or that are like they used to be in two different ways. They usually either respond by becoming very judgmental or by becoming very supportive. For example, if you've ever known someone that made a a tremendous life change in their health, They started eating better. They started exercising better. And they they lost weight. Oftentimes, those two responses look like, oh, I I can't believe you're still eating that. Don't you know what that's doing to you? That's horrible for you. You, Get that out of your face, you dum-dum. Wait, you don't go to the gym? What, what's, don't you know how important exercise is? I go to the gym six days a week, sometimes eight times a week. When you don't even go once, what is your problem? Have you ever heard that before? Or maybe you've heard someone that, that's started to fight and overcome addiction. Don't you know what that cigarette is doing to your lungs? Or, haven't you seen pictures of, of the livers of people that drink alcohol? Don't you know what you're doing to your body? You're killing yourself. What is wrong with you, you moron? Stop it. Be like me. I went cold turkey. Just stop. Right? That's the judgmental choice that many people make. But there's also others that take the opposite path. The people that have made health improvements. Oh, I know how good ice cream is. I would eat half a gallon at a time. But you know, I've I've really cut back and it's and it's helped a lot. You know, I still eat ice cream because ice cream is just amazing. But you know, but I've I've Cut back from half a gallon to maybe one scoop every once in a while. Oh, I, and I know how hard it is to go to the gym. I know how comfortable your bed is in the morning. I know how easy it is to, to come home and just crash on the couch with some Netflix after work. But you know what? Come to the gym with me. I have a guest pass. I'll I'll show you how to use some of those complicated machines. In fact, I have a program that I started to use, a a basic introductory program that that I'll share with you. You We can go and we can be workout partners. Oh, I I know how, how strong that addiction to alcohol is. But come, come with me. Let's go to a meeting. You don't have to say anything. If you don't like it, it's fine. But let's just go and, and, and see what you think. 
And if, and if it's something you're interested in, you know, I, I, can, I can be your sponsor. I'll go through this journey, this difficult journey with you. Two different kinds of responses, right? Same significant life change, but two different ways to respond to the people that are where you used to be. And Paul is saying, look, you used to be like those other people. You used to be a Cretan, 100%. But Jesus has changed you. Jesus has transformed your life with grace. And now you have a choice to make. But Paul's saying you, you really don't. Because if you really are following Christ, you're not going to be a judgmental jerk to people. He says, because you have experienced the grace and the support of Jesus, you are going to want to extend that grace and support to others. This teaching is true, he says. I want you to be sure that people understand these things. And here's this key sentence. Then those who believe in God will be careful to use their lives for doing good. Those who believe in God will use their lives to do good. These things are good and will help a few. Is that what he says? He says they will help most. Is that correct? No. He says they will help who? Everyone. He says, when you as followers of God use your life to do good, that is going to help everyone. If you use your life just to be a judgmental doofus, it's going to help you, right? It's going to help your ego. It's going to help you feel better than other people. But Paul is saying, no, that's not how you're supposed to live your life. When you dedicate your life to doing good, then everyone is helped, not just you. You're going to lift other people up. You're going to support other people. And in that process, it's going to be a benefit to you as well. Everyone is going to be helped. This is a win, 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 win situation. What would it be like if the very first thought, the very first gut reaction that non-Christians had about Christians was that that's the group that is helpful. What would that be like if the very first thing that went through a non-Christian's mind when they heard that term Christian was, yeah, those are the people that, that go out of their way to be helpful. Not, oh, the Christians, those are those judgmental people. Oh, the Christians, those are those exclusive people. Oh, those Christians, those are those bossy people. What if they thought immediately about Christians or, oh, you know, there's never been a time in my life where I've been in trouble and a Christian hasn't come along and helped me in a, in a substantial way, not just a, oh, my thoughts and prayers kind of way. What if they thought every time I face an obstacle in my life, whether it was with a relationship or with finances or with health, what if there was a Christian in my life, whether it was my, my neighbor or my coworker or my brother or cousin or niece, what if every time I faced trouble in life, there was a Christian there offering his or her hand to me? Because this is what Paul is saying that we're to do. As followers of God, we are to help people. This is the message. This is our mission. To follow God and help others. To be a follower of God is to be a helper of people. Not just sometimes, not just the people that you like. To be a follower of God means to do good for 
everyone. He continues in verse 9 and says, But stay away from those who have foolish arguments and talk about useless family histories and argue and quarrel about the law. Those things are worth nothing and will not help anyone. He says, stop it. Stop arguing about this little detail or that little detail. It doesn't matter if you're right. Good for you if you're right, but you're not going to do it. You're not making a difference by arguing. You can pull out these fact after fact, statistic after statistic to to show why you need to vote this way or that way. But by arguing, you're not really going to convince a Democrat to become a Republican or a Republican to become a Democrat. You could pull out all the proof texts in the world and and you could have the Bible memorized and and argue theology till you're blue in the face and and, and prove text after use proof text after proof text. But you're not really going to convert someone through an argument to become a Christian or, more specifically, a Seventh-day Adventist. Arguing back and forth, being in constant conflict, is no good for anyone. I won't say never, but I can guarantee you that more people are converted. More people have a substantive life change out of someone helping them than someone arguing with them. And this is why Paul is saying you need to do good. You need to help others. Stop arguing. Stop fighting. Stop quarreling. Because that is just a waste of time, of everyone's time. It does no good to anyone. It is a distraction. If you think, oh yeah, okay, I could go out and help someone, but no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sit in, I'm going to dig into this comment section, and I am going to win this argument. What good are you doing? No one's going to come to your point of view because you rattled off a lot of comments in the debate there. But they might, they just might see where you're coming from if you go and you meet them where they are, where they're struggling. And say, hey, I care about you. Can I help you? Paul is saying all that argument, all that quarreling, that's a distraction from the mission. You think you're doing good by by winning a debate, by winning an argument, but you're not. You're just spinning your wheels. You're wasting your time. Go out and do something good. This is the mission. In fact, Paul puts it even in stronger language in verses 10 to 11. He says, after a first and second warning, avoid someone who causes arguments. You can know that such people are evil and sinful. Their own sins prove them wrong. He says, people that that go around and, and stir up things just to stir up things. People that love to debate and have arguments with you and then you and then you and then you and then me. Those people aren't just trouble. Those people aren't just annoying. Paul says those people are evil. And he says to Titus, don't be around them. In your church, if they keep quarreling, get them out. Give them one warning, two warnings, but three strikes, and you're out. Stop quarreling because that is purposeless. It is a distraction. It stops you from being able to accomplish your mission. If you've been around church for any length of time, you've probably heard the term church discipline. And usually that applies to people that maybe have had affairs or have done some shady things with their money or maybe started to spread some heresy. But have you ever heard of someone receiving church discipline because they liked to argue? Because 
they wouldn't let things go. This is what Paul is saying. You cannot be like that. You cannot be focused on these kinds of arguments and conflict and winning and losing and all of this other nonsense because that's what it is. It's not a help to anyone to be a follower of God is to be a helper of people. Paul says there in the midst of this horrible Cretan culture that are just in it for themselves, in it to win financially, win through violence, win through their increased reputations and power. So there in this culture, you are to do the opposite. You are there not to win, but to help. Because you and I have been transformed by the grace of God. And that changes everything. This morning, I know I want to follow Christ. This morning, I know that Christ's grace has changed my life and continues to change my life. This morning, I know that I want to be a conduit of that grace and that support and that love to others. This morning, I want to follow God and I want to help others have better lives because that is what God has done for me. And I hope and I pray that this is what you want to do as well.